Oaks. Everybody hear me now? <laughs> Good. Okay, welcome to St. John's Presbyterian Church on Sunday, August the 27th. Uh, the Reverend Maureen Walter is on vacation. I am Elizabeth Spears, and I'll be running the service this morning, but Maureen, after her good vacation, will be back next week. So as we uh, begin our service this morning, let us begin with the call to worship printed on the bulletin that you picked up on the way in. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Lord, with gladness. Give thanks to the Lord and bless his name. For the Lord is good and love of God endures forever. Let us worship God. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 26, as, as pants the heart, hymn number 26, and we'll do verses one, two, and five. Let us pray. We gather this day to worship you, Lord, in your sanctuary, and we give thanks to you as you have given us your Son. We have come, as usual, from our busy weeks, but we've had wonderful weather and our challenges and frustrations and the good news around the things that are getting better with respect to wildfires in a country of Canada and around the world is wonderful. But we still have a lot of our friends and neighbors and people of the world who are challenged by the climate change and specifically the wildfires. We ask you to be with all of those who are fighting the fires, for all of those who've been displaced, for all of those who've lost. And as we meet this morning, we ask that you be with us as we listen to your word and sing your praises. So we ask that your spirit work within us so that we may glorify your name and be blessed because we came. In Christ's name, amen. Our Psalm reading this morning is number 41 in this book that you picked up when you came in. Blessed are those who consider the poor, delivers them 
in the day of trouble. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. They are called blessed in the land. You do not give them up to the will of their enemies. The Lord sustains them in the sun. If their illness, he heal their infirmities. As for me, I said, O Lord, be gracious to me. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies wander in malice when I will die and my name perish. When they come to see me, they utter empty words while their hearts gather mischief. When they go out, they tell it abroad. All who hate me whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. They think that a deadly thing has fastened on me. I will not rise again from where I lie. Even my bosom friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted a heel against me. But you, O Lord, be gracious to me and raise me up that I may repay them. Know that you are pleased with me because my enemy has not triumphed over me. But you have upheld me because of my integrity and set me in your presence forever. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen, amen. In our first scripture reading this morning, our, one of our session members, Julie, will read for us. Good morning, everyone. It's nice we're getting back into my kind of weather. <laughs> the first reading today is 1 Corinthians from uh, number one, verses one, from 17 to 31. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intellect. I will prostrate. Where is the wise, is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God, has not God made foolish the wise wisdom of the word, world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world, through its wisdom, did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were intellectual. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world 
and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The other two readings this morning are also from 1 Corinthians. The next one is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 to 16. Wisdom from the Spirit. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit whom is from God that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? In the final reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 21. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that they may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are 
persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuge of the world. I am not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I am sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful to the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Jesus Christ, who agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing, and then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What you do, what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? The word of the Lord. Our next hymn is number 350, and we will sing all three verses. 350, to God be the glory.
I entitled the sermon this morning, Know-It-Alls, which is a title set of words that we use a lot, but it really applies to what Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians in the readings that we did this morning. He has been teaching and preaching and providing the word of God to the Jews and the Gentiles of his, Gentiles of his time. And in Corinth, the people have begun to go off on their own, and so they began to think they knew it all. And so the question is, what does that really mean? And what were they doing? And what was Paul trying to do to help them? So have you ever been driving along the road, especially in the wintertime, and you thought you had the car under control, especially on the icy road or a snowy road? And then you find the car takes a direction of its own due to the road conditions. And I remember once I was driving along Highway 2 on my way to Kingston. It was icy and snowy. I got off the 401 because it was so bad. And the next thing, I'm driving the other way. I'm going at 20 kilometers an hour the other way. It, you, have, you think you're under control, but you're not. In our readings today, the Corinthians were under the same impression. Paul had helped them develop their Christian community, and they thought they were in control of it. However, Paul had become concerned when he recognized that the Corinthians were beginning to rely on their own intelligence to give them the answers they needed rather than God, and were ignoring the teachings of Christ. Paul knew that the human mind on its own would never lead to God's truth. Christ dying on the cross for people's sins seemed foolish to those on the road to death and ruin, but to those headed towards life, it is the power of God. In the play, Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, Lucy, some of you may not know this one, but Lucy takes Linus around in one scene and gives him a nature lesson. She, matter of fact, in her response, shares some important facts about nature that she's discovered on her own. See the clouds? They made the wind blow. Do you know the snow comes up? I know it looks like it comes down, but that's just because the wind blows it all around. It really comes up just like the grass. And what makes the grass grow? Bugs. They run around tugging and pulling at all the little blades until they grow nice and tall. Some of the Corinthians thought they knew all about the universe and all about God's universe. They had full confidence in the knowledge they had gained through their own intellectual efforts. But their knowledge about God was as inadequate, inadequate as Lucy's knowledge about nature. You can't know God by looking around and making observations from your own limited perspective. Paul says this and was very, very concerned about the Corinthians. He knew that knowing the right words to pray, memorizing hundreds of Bible verses, or being able to list all the main doctrines in the Bible while good was definitely not enough. The power of the good news about Christ's dead, death did not depend on how intellectual you were. It depended totally on what God had done, which was what Paul was trying to tell the Corinthians. He saw them turning away from the gospel, which was causing them problems. And in our first reading, verse 17, Paul stated, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? And in verse 22, 
For the Jews demand signs and the Greeks demand wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block for Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. And in verse 27, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. So how does this apply today? Let's take a look at an example. If a new football play that a team does doesn't work for the second or third time when it's used in the game, the players explain it by saying, the other team is wise to it. When someone says the leaders of a country made a wide decision, he or she usually means that the leaders made a decision that he or she agrees with. The word wise is used in a number of ways by all of us. Paul also used the word wise, but in different ways. For example, he spoke of the person's speaking ability as a kind of wisdom that could be harmful in Corinthians 1, verse 17. He also talked about the wisdom of the world or of this age as something empty and foolish in verse 20. But he spoke of the wisdom of God and of Jesus Christ as the wisdom from God, as something to be desired and trusted in a number of the verses in 1 Corinthians. Thus, Paul discussed both good and bad wisdom. But this is a very difficult concept to address. What is the difference he is trying to make in 1 Corinthians to the people of Corinth who were focused on their own abilities to explain Christianity? Well, think about what we do. There's many self-help books or blogs or videos on topics about how to get rich, how to mediate, and how to live longer. All of these things are very popular and in many, many cases, very useful to us all. The one thing <coughs> they had in common is that you, <coughs> sorry, that you alone are the key to your own happiness or success if you follow their prescription. You follow the prescriptions of the Corinthians, then you are the key to your own happiness. There's also a book, or many books, on how to improve your speaking ability. And it might teach you how to persuade others or how to grab your listener's attention. And if you're becoming a salesperson, this is something that's nailed into you, as I used to put training courses together on how to be salespeople. How do you persuade someone to buy something that's maybe a little bit bigger, more expensive than they thought they were going to do? Or how do you try to upsell them? something to them. And it's important that we all continue to improve our own ability, but the problem, as Paul says, comes if you depend only on your own abilities and techniques to convince others to become Christians. This is the point Paul is making between good and bad wisdom. Some of you may know the name Dwight Moody, who was an evangelist. And one day, he was stopped on the street by a drunk who said, hey, aren't you Moody, the evangelist? I'm one of your converts. Moody answered, you must be. You're surely not one of the Lord's. Moody knew the difference between his own persuasive words and God's wisdom and power like the Corinthians who were trying to convert individuals using their own persuasive words. Paul told the Corinthians that the world's wisdom is foolish. Learning intelligence can't bridge the gap between you and God. Only God can. Of course, this doesn't mean a Christian should stop thinking or 
not know why he believes what he or she does. People are made in God's image, and that image includes the ability to think, reason, understand, and make moral decisions. Scriptures clearly teach that each individual will be held responsible for the choices that he or she makes in their own life on earth, and that's based on the knowledge they've been given. Paul in the scripture was telling the Corinthians they had been letting their limited human knowledge get in the way of their faith in Christ. They were drifting away from the gospel and substituting their own ideas, and this was be becoming a major concern for Paul. When Paul talked about true wisdom, he meant both a plan and a person. God's wisdom includes both creation and recreation. God created the world and all of life. He also sent his son to earth to make it possible for any who would like to be forgiven of their sins to have a new life through Jesus' death. When someone becomes a Christian, that's recreation. God gives them a fresh, new life that will never end. But why did this type of wisdom seem foolish to both the Jews and the Greeks? Was it cultural? Were they were looking in the wrong direction for their salvation? Yes, but why? Their focus was, in fact, based on their cultural beliefs. The Jews thought the Messiah would be a powerful political leader who would use his supernatural powers to overthrow the government and set up a Jewish government as outlined many times in the scripture. Then they would be in power. They never considered the possibility that the Messiah might have to suffer and die a disgraceful death to overthrow the powers of evil. To the Greeks, Jesus' humility and his suffering was meaningless because they believed the events in history and human bodies were both temporal and unreal. Only the external truths of philosophy and the souls of individuals were real to them. So to believe that the death of one person in history had anything to do with God or salvation to them was a joke. Thus, both the Jews and Greeks challenged Paul's idea as he preached Christ crucified to the power-starved Jews and the body-defying Greeks. What seemed weak and foolish in their minds was more powerful and wide than they could begin to imagine. Based on Paul's teaching, the Corinthian Christians should have known better than to start patting themselves on the back and depending on their own knowledge instead of trusting God for their salvation. But they are not the only Christians who have been sidetracked this way. Some people today think that certain Christians have pers a personal pipeline to God or special knowledge through some mystical experience. But people who believe this misunderstand who God really is as he provides recreation to individuals who accept his teaching and one individual does not have priority over another. Each of us is different with different talents and skills. Paul didn't depend on tricky arguments or slick debating devices to convince the Corinthians of the truth of the good news about Christ. Of course, he didn't avoid any logic or organization when he preached, but he was careful not to trick them into believing something only because of the way he said it. Above all else, Paul wanted the Spirit of God to convince them, not his words. That way, any change in their lives would be the result of God working in them. Such a change would affect the core of their lives and be permanent. Paul wanted to see the Christians sold out to God, not just psyched. A mature or spiritual Christian is not someone who can recite the entire Bible, but someone who has received and confesses Christ as their Lord and Savior. And as a result, 
They love others in all circumstances of life. Have you ever known someone who thinks he knows more about everything than anyone else? That person really isn't easy to get along with, are they? Well, Paul had to get along with a church full of people like that in Corinth. When the Corinthians began to think they knew more than anyone else, including Paul and the other apostles, that meant big trouble. Why? Because they were supposed to be living examples of Christianity in the middle of a non-Christian culture. Paul knew that they began showing selfish pride instead of love and concern for others. That if they did that and continued to do so, they would turn people away from the gospel. Not only that, but could the Corinthian Christians really claim to be followers of Christ if they refused to show Christ's love in their lives? This focus of the Corinthians bothered Paul so much that he used some cutting sarcasm to show them how harmful and wrong their whole attitude was. He made a night and day comparison between them and the apostles. In 1 Corinthians 4.13, he stated, they lived like rich kings while the apostles suffered in nearly every possible way, from going without food and clothes to being treated like the scum of the earth. What the Christians or Corinthians had forgotten was that anything and everything they had was a gift, including their knowledge and their abilities. Paul bluntly asked, them, what have, <coughs> sorry, what do you have that you did not receive in Corinthians 4 and 7? So how does this apply today? Whenever we start to think that we're just a little better than anyone else, we should remember Paul's pointed question. It might save us from having overinflated egos destined to get punctured. Amen. Our next hymn is number 338. There's only two verses. We'll sing both. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Um, there is a coffee hour after the service today in the social suite behind us. Um, our offering, we don't put plate around. Um, it is on the communion table, and if you have one and you'd like to put it in there, if not, uh, if you have other ways you want to give, talk to our um, treasurer, Nancy Stevenson, and her email is on the bulletin. I uh, want to thank Ross Dritton, who is with us again today very much, uh, putting up with me, getting hymns and sorted. Uh, we've enjoyed very much, and as he said earlier this morning, he's going to miss coming next week because Grace should be back as well from her vacation. Um, that's all the announcements I have. Does anyone else have any announcements? Thanks very much. <laughs> I don't, I haven't heard. How is Charlotte? Anybody have an update? Nancy saw her yesterday. She's the same. Okay. So as we uh, move then into our prayers, we'll remember everyone who is on our list of people who had surgery, been ill, continue to be ill, and w wish them God's blessing. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the world in which we live and the friends and colleagues that we interact with and confide with and share our daily lives. Lord, you provide the strength we need to, and the support to us in our weaknesses and challenges. And we ask you to be with those individuals of our congregation or within our social groups who have been ill, who've had surgery, who continue to recover from surgery, or who are actually living with the challenges that their illness brings them. We ask not only that you be with them, but you help us to support them as they need in their daily lives. We want to ask you also to be with uh, both Grace and Maureen this week as they finish up their vacations and join us again next week. And we want to thank you and we pray to you for all those who raise us up and inspire us. For the meaning and purpose of life and the opportunities we have to serve the Lord. We ask you to help us, as Paul worked with the Corinthians, to help us better understand how we have the wisdom of God within us and we can use that wisdom to help others understand the wisdom of God. We thank you for the gifts of renewal and inspiration, for the gifts of music, art, and other things that enrich our lives, for God's healing in all things, and the gift of gratitude. We thank you for the courage and strength that we have to live our daily lives. We thank those in the world who work for justice and mercy to ensure that those within the world that need that support have it. We again thank you for the support you have given to the individuals who have had to vacate their homes due to fires in our country and other countries around the world. We ask you to be with them and their families. We also ask you to be with the families of those who lost loved ones as a result of those fires. We pray for the people of the Ukraine, 
as this war continues on and many lives are lost or changed completely. We also pray for the people of Russia who have a leadership that brought the war forward. We pray for your support in our ability to help, mul <coughs> help multiply those in your community and recognize when we might con be contributing to the division of those within our community. We do this in Christ's name and continue to pray as Jesus taught us to. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 358, There is a Redeemer. And there's three verses. We'll sing all three verses. As we leave this sanctuary and go out into the community this week, help us to try to incorporate God's wisdom into our actions in order to achieve some support for the Christians within our community. Amen. <laughs>